who's recording. Is that Mattia? So hello, hi everyone. Um, my name is Roberta Ricetti. Yes, we have met already on based at Bornwich University. And uh, yes, we are um, we are at the last session of this year for our set seminar. So if you haven't been at one of our research seminars before, that's our uh, socio-ecological transition seminar. It's a joint initiative between three universities. So the research group on collective action change and transition at the University of Trento, the Center for Sustainable and Socially Responsible Consumption at Bournemouth University, at the Environmental Sociology section at the University of Oribro. So we are three universities that are collaborating and having um, wonderful international speakers with the aim of thinking with critical instruments of social ecological transition with a special focus on everyday life, consumption and times of crisis. So today's um, speaker is going to be introduced by uh, Monica and Sarah. So I'm just going to leave the floor uh, to them. Thank you, Roberta. So today um, we have an exciting seminar ahead of us, and we are happy to have uh, Marcus Wissen here, who will talk on the topic of the empirical, empirical mode of living, uh, on which he has written articles, but also co-authored the book with the same title, uh, together with uh, Ulrich Brand. And uh, I will leave the word to you in a minute. Um, I just want to introduce our discussants as well before I do that. We have two discussants. It's uh, Dennis Eversberg from University of Jena. And Dennis is a political sociologist that study social ecological movements, environmental politics, mentalities, and social structures. And we have Gustavo Garcia Lopez from University of Coimbra and Gustavio's research is at the intersection of ecology and the political and he also has an interest in uh, decolonial or postcolonial theory with a focus on South America so I'm sure that we will have uh, an interesting and fruitful discussion coming up um, in terms of the structure of the seminar we will have a presentation on around 30 to 45 minutes from Marcus and then uh, Dennis and Gustavo will um, start up the discussion for about um, 20 minutes and we'll have some 20 to half an hour by the end for comments and discussion from the whole group. Uh, and before we start that, I will give some directives of how we, how we can have the, the discussion in the whole group. Um, but with that, I want to welcome you, Marcus, um, to give us your uh, talk. Yeah, many thanks for the invitation and uh, introduction. And the Imperial Mode of Living is um, the title of my presentation. And as Monica already said, um, it is based on a book co-authored with Ulrich Brandt that was published in Germany in 2017 and the English translation um, was published last year in 2021. Yeah, I would like to, um, to talk just a moment. Oh, now it works. The structure of my, my presentation consists of three steps. First of all, I would like to introduce into the concept imperial mode of living that is um, verify what exactly is meant by this term. Secondly, I would like to have a look at the crisis of the imperial mode of living. And thirdly, I am going to present competing crisis strategies and focusing one particular strategy that, yeah, one can call a social ecological transformation or transition or solidarity mode of living as we have called it in our book. To start with, the concept of the imperial mode of living. So these examples are quite familiar to all of us. They refer to certain forms of production and consumption that our everyday lives are based upon, which nevertheless use a lot of resources and are based on the exploitation of labor power in a global scale. 
So one example is taken from the textile industry. We know that only a small share of the price for um, a T-shirt that we pay in a store in Northern Europe, in the global north, actually rece um, re receives the, the workers, the usually female workers who have produced the T-shirt. We know that the meat consumption is much too high. Meat consumption, meat production is a very important factor in climate change. It produces CO2 emissions. It produces a lot of suffering of animals. It produces very bad working conditions in the meat factories in the global north itself. Electricity is still generated by using lignite brown coal in Germany. Brown coal is still a very important factor in the electricity generation. Although a phase out of the coal, brown coal um, um, as a source of electricity has been agreed upon by 2038, probably will come earlier, but this is the agreement. It's much too late because that is a very important driving force for climate change. And of course, mobility, northern mobility patterns based on a car-centered infrastructure system are not sustainable in many social and economic areas. Progresses have been reached in the recent years, but not in mobility in Europe. The CO2 emissions from the mobility sector are stagnating or even increasing. And I think um, if it is possible to hold um, to manage climate change somehow, that is to achieve the 1.5 degrees target, also depends on what is happening in the mobility sector in the next years. So these are examples for unsustainable patterns of production and consumption, patterns of production and con consumption that are deeply rooted in everyday perceptions and practices in infrastructures, in power relations, institutions and social structures, particularly in the countries of the global north, that are based on an unequal appropriation of nature, and labor power on a global scale. And if we talk about nature, we mean both resources and things, that is ecosystems that absorb more from a certain um, material than they themselves emit to their environment, like for example, in rainforests in the case of CO2. Production and consumption patterns that produce enormous social and ecological costs and externalize them in space and time in time towards future generations and in space towards people, mainly in the global south. They therefore cannot be generalized from a social ecological point of view and instead presuppose exclusiveness and exclusion. That is what we have called the imperial mode of living. And from our understanding, the imperial mode of living is a category of hegemony theory that aims to connect everyday life with overarching social and international structures, and that tries to reveal the non-generalizable preconditions of capitalist production and consumption patterns. The category imperial mode of living focuses on social practices and structural conditions that render their destructive character invisible through externalization. So if you look at a car, you cannot see the socio-ecological conditions under which the resources were extracted that are used for its construction. The meat in our supermarkets is silent about the suffering of the animals, about the working conditions in the meat factories, about the CO2, uh, in the CO2 emissions. In supermarkets or in car dealerships, Completely different aspects of their products are stressed, like power, masculinity, security, speed, autonomy, freedom. These are the associations that we should have when we buy a product. Or we should have in order to be motivated to buy, buy a product, but the dark sides of the history and the socio-ecological history of these products are systematically invisibilized. The imperial mode of living cannot be generalized. It presupposes exclusiveness. And that also means that it is based and secure, that is based on and secured by an imperialist world order. 
with we we use the term imperial and not imperialist that does not mean that we want to distance ourselves from imperialism we would say that the current world order is indeed an imperialist one and the criterion would be that certain countries exert power and domination beyond their own borders if we take this as a criterion as a basic criterion for imperialism then the current world order is an imperialist one we would say that imperialism is both a phase in the development of capitalism the phase that shaped the particularly the second half of the 19th century until and the second the first world war at the beginning of the 20th century but it is also a structural feature of capitalist economies they need an external sphere where they can shift their coast on they need this external sphere for economic reasons for ecological reasons for social reasons and without this external sphere they can hardly exist so if this is the case then the current world order is an imperialist one and the imperialism and the imperial mode of living are closely interrelated what we are interested in is why this imperial imperialist world order works more or less despite its imperialist and and crew and 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 um, very um, violent character our argument would be that this is the case because the imperialist character is rendered invisible through multiple acts of producing and consuming we could say that the imperial mode of living normalizing normalizes imperialism in everyday practices of people mainly in the global south in the global north the imperial mode of living is not simply an issue of choice one cannot simply elude it as a member of a capitalist society we are socialized into the imperial mode of living the workers in a car factory cannot influence the working conditions of the people who extract the resources that are built into the parts which they put together to complete automobiles they cannot influence the social condi the ecological conditions under which the resources are extracted they are structurally involved into the imperial mode of living because of the subaltern status in capitalist societies that leaves them hardly another choice than selling their labor power on the labor market and selling it also for purposes that are environmentally and socially destructive as consumers we cannot um, question the environmental history the social history of the individual products that we purchase that wouldn't be possible our everyday lives would become too complicated by this of course we have certain choices that's right but nevertheless they are restricted we can choose to buy a product or not to buy a product but as individual consumers we do not have the possibility to influence the way this product is produced the social ecological conditions of its production so the imperial mode of living is a constraint in capitalist societies at the same time however it is highly attractive it allows for the participation in social wealth and it also enhances our spatial reach via airplanes for example one could say that the imperial mode of living thus is at the same time a necessity and a promise a constraint and a precondition of participation in capitalist societies so this would be my first part the, on the concept of the imperial mode of living my second part is more a diagnosis an empirical diagnosis to which extent has this mode of living got into a crisis or to which extent is it at the heart of multiple crises humankind is currently facing one important development in this respect is what earth system scientists have called the great acceleration i think most of you will be familiar with this graph that is taken from an article by will stefan and others and shows that from the mid of the 20th century onwards a lot of indicators have um, have have increased indicators that are important for measuring the resource use of um, of the world here yeah so total real gdp foreign day direct investment water use fertilizer consumption 
paper consumption, McDonald's restaurants, international tourism, and other indicators have very drastically increased from the 1950s onwards. This has been named the Great Acceleration. It is, develop it is a development that has mainly taken place in the global north, but also in some countries of the global south. And it signifies an enormous increase in resource use and the use of things. That is an enormous um, increase in the um, and use and utilization of nature, a development that is definitely not sustainable. More recently, we can um, see that this development has, one could say that this, this great acceleration stands for a social generalization of the imperial mode of living. Before the Second World War, this mode of living used to be a phenomenon of the upper classes, of the production and consumption patterns that serve the upper classes. But after the Second World War, in the framework of the Fordist class compromise, there was a certain social generalization that did not, that did by no means level down class differences or other difference, gender differences in how resources are used. But nevertheless, there was a change and there was an increase in wealth also of parts of the working, working class from which particularly the male white working class benefited. More recently, this social generalization has been accompanied by a kind of global or spatial generalization. And this is symbolized in this graph that shows us the fossil fuel combustions in the United States and in China, both total and per capita. What you can see here is that the, um, that the total um, CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion in China has um, have outpaced and um, so, uh, have um, become um, higher heavy than the ones in the United States from more or less 2005 onwards. One has to relativize these findings in three ways. Two ways are implied in this graph. The first one is the per capita emissions that are still um, lower in China than in the United States. And the second relativization is the so-called historical guilt, the historical responsibility. We can see that China started from a very low level from the beginning of the 1970s and accelerated um, its, um, its um, emission of fossil fuels drastically from the early 2000s onwards. The United States, in contrast, and also, of course, Europe um, were already big emitters when China started with its emission activities, or started to increase its emission activities. That means there is a certain historical responsibility for the global north, and I think this is a very important dimension of the discussions in the um, the, in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change about the historical responsibility. Who is responsible for the climate crisis that we're in now? And I think it's mainly the countries of the global north. And this argument that they at first would have to reduce the CO2 emissions, an argument that is um, brought forth by developing countries and also by in yeah, more recently industrialized countries like China or India is quite plausible, which does not mean that the newly industrialized countries can um, do the same as the early industrialized countries have done. We know that this wouldn't be possible for climatic reasons. And the third relativization that is not inside in this graph is the indicator that is used here. This is a territorial indicator, that is that um, the emissions that um, are produced on a certain territory are assigned to the respective country and not um, to the country where the products um, that have been produced are used. You know? So if, for example, steel is produced in China and um, then exported to Europe, um, Within this indicator, the CO2 emissions in the production of this in the production process of steel would be assigned to China and not to Europe. In a consumption-based indicator, like for example, the, the material footprint indicators, the emissions would be assigned to the country where the product is used. 
Nevertheless, in spite of these relativizations, one has to say that this development is highly problematic, that we can see a generalization of a mode of living and production that for social ecological reasons cannot be generalized. That means that we are in a problematic constellation. As said before, this mode of living and production is exclusive. It requires exclusiveness and exclusion. However, its exclusiveness is threatened. It's threatened by the development of so-called emerging economies. It's also threatened um, by um, the fact that ever more people worldwide for climatic reasons, for reasons of war, for whatever reasons, are not able to simply bear the cost of the imperial mode of living any longer. They are looking for survival for better living in those countries who um, yeah, have produced the crisis yeah, through their mode of living and production and flee their home countries or migrate towards the global north. Yeah. So the exclusiveness is threatened and the question, the, the result of this is that we are facing severe and increasing eco imperial tensions. Uh, eco imperial tensions, a term that we use in our book, in order to um, understand the current conflicts and the rising tensions in the world order from an ecological perspective. We, of course, don't want to be monocausal and explain everything that happens in the world with an ecological or socio ecological issues. Of course, there are other log logics that have to be taken into account. But I think it's also important to understand the socio ecological background of the rising imperial eco and the, the rising imperialist tensions that we can observe tensions for resources like metals that become ever more important in the ecological modernization of industrialized societies tensions for sinks you know, that is what the international climate policy is about that is a conflict about who is able who is allowed to use the global sinks and who is allowed to go on with emitting co2 and who has to restrict its his or uh, his or her CO2 emissions, yeah, because it's um, not um, we cannot afford them any longer. Yeah, that is also a tension that is fought out that characterizes the conflicts on in in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And so one could say because of this threatened exclusiveness, because of the fact that the imperial mode of living is generalizing globally, although for socio-ecological reasons, it, it is not possible to generalize this mode of living and producing globally, we are facing eco-imperial tensions that make this mode of living increasingly crisis-prone and precarious. Yeah, to come to my last point, um, there are, I would say there are three competing crisis strategies in, in, this, in, in this situation crisis strategies that um, try to cope with this increasing um, precariousness of the imperial mode of living. And the first uh, crisis strategy could be called an authoritarian stabilization of the imperial mode of living. This is the program of the right, yeah? the right-wing governments, the right-wing social forces, social movements that have gained strength worldwide in recent years. Yeah? And I think the problem of this right wing forces is to stabilize the, um, author the, the imperial mode of living in an authoritarian manner. That means to stabilize it exclusively, to um, suggest their electorate that they can go on as they have done in the last decades. And um, they, that is the right wing forces, as soon as they have, in have, got, have come in, into government, um, are able to defend the claims of um, the, um, of, uh, let's say, um, white, male, middle, upper class, particular, particular uh, well, partially also working classes against the claims of those who would like to participate in the globe, in the imperial mode of living. So Donald Trump may serve here as may, may, may serve an example as an example here. He. Um, intensified um, a trade war with China in order to keep this global competitor down. Yeah? 
of course, this was not only for ecological reasons, but it was a kind of stabilizing certain mode of living. He also started to build a wall at the border to Mexico in order to prevent the migrants from South America from entering the United States. So he tried to stabilize the imperial mode of living exclusively and with authoritarian means for a certain territory and that the right-wing forces are on the rise. I think it's also due to the fact that they um, able to um, to um, promise um, and to to convince their electorate um, much better than their bourgeois counterpart from their ability to safeguard the imperial mode of living in a time where this mode of living has become increasingly precarious. That would be one development, one strategy to cope with the crisis of the imperial mode of living. A second strategy um, is the ecological modernization of the imperial mode of living. This is about eco-efficiency, for example. It is about market-driven and technological fixes towards the crisis of the imperial mode of living. It is about how um, we can get out of the dilemma, how we can get out of the ecological crisis, or how can we make the crisis processable via ecological modernization. Efficiency is very important here, creating products that use less resources without um, without um, losing their, um, their, their functionality, yeah? or creating products that um, that that um, release the pressure on the environment, you know, electro-automobility, renewable energies is very important in this respect. Of course, the individual inventions are good, yeah? but um, the problem is that they are inserted in an overall orientation and in structural constraints towards competition and economic growth so that their environmental, that their possible environmental effects are overcompensated by the economic growth and may also contribute to even enhancing the environmental damage. The danger with the ecological modernization is that there is a progress on the wrong object as the environmental sociologist Josef Huber has called it. Yeah. So we improve cars and improve them, improve them, yeah, make them ever more ecologically efficient. But is that really a progress? The problem, I would say, is the car-centered transport system itself. And that is not overcoming by making cars ever more, ever more resource efficient or ecologically friendly. The efficiency gains, I already mentioned, that can be overcompensated by economic growth. And the resource dependency is not terminated. It is more or less shifted, yeah? for example, from fossil fuels towards metals and other resources that are needed for a green economy. So we will have to look at the potentials of a third transformation strategy, the social ecological transformation. I think Dennis is also going to talk a bit more about these three um, strategies because as far as I have um, um, known from your research, the three strategies are also reflected in the mentalities that you have identified in your research. But I think we can come to this later on. Let me conclude with, ha with having a, a look at the social ecological transformation. That would be an alternative that is desirable, let's say. Yeah? So um, an alternative for which a lot of progressive social forces worldwide are fighting. I would say there are basically three elements of the um, socio-ecological transformation or the solidarity mode of living, as we have called it in our book. The first one is sufficiency and ecological reflex reflexivity. It would be um, in contrast to efficiency. Uh, sufficiency does not only improve products, it also asks do we need this product? Do we need it for a good life? Do we have to produce it? Or do we have it to produce it in the amount it has been produced before? So it's much more far reaching. It is about, and that would be the second element, it is about the use value orientation and the logic of care. That is the economy thought and shaped from a completely different perspective. 
the capitalist economy, as we know, is driven by a profit by by, by profit maxim, uh, maximization by uh, an exchange value orientation. The to, the the objective of um, the capital of of of, of um, capitalist firms is not to satisfy certain needs. The objective is to make profit. Satisfying needs is only something that is derived from this primary objective of the capitalist economy. A product has to satisfy needs, has to satisfy needs that it maybe um, has um, itself um, created. It has to satisfy these needs in order to um, in, in, in order to be sold. Yeah? If it does not satisfy any need, if it does not create any need, then it is not got, it's not going to be sold. And the the surplus value that is um, that is incorporated in this product is not to be realized. The product is devalued, and um, maybe also the machines and the means of production that have been used to produce it are um, devalued. Yeah. So um, capitalism is about profit maximization. Capitalism is about exchange value. But we will have to think about use value orientation and the logic of care. We'll have to put those activities center stage that provide services and products on which society essentially depends. Yeah. And we will have to shrink down the capitalist economy. The third um, element that we have identified or would be that we consider important for a solidarity mode of living is radical democracy and equality. I think um, strengthening an economy and a society that is based on sufficiency and use value orientation cannot be done by market forces. It requires democracy, radical democracy, democracy that goes much beyond the existing liberal democracy. It also requires equality, equality in the access towards basic infrastructures. Efficiency issues can be answered by the market, but sufficiency issues, it, that means what is necessary for a good life, cannot be answered by the market. They could be answered perhaps by an authoritarian state, but, but we do not want an authoritarian state. So the alternative is democracy and democratizing liberal democracy going beyond the constraints of liberal democracy that is democratizing, for example, also the economy. That seems to be rather abstract, but I think these are no abstract principles, but these are many, these are implications of many social struggles worldwide. Struggles on infrastructures, on energy democracy, on food sovereignty, on housing, on alternative transport systems. The elements are also reflected in more recent academic debates on and also political debates on universal basic services, on the foundational economy, on socialization. There seems to be an implicit narrative in these debates and struggles that one could perhaps call a democratic, internationalist, ecological, feminist infrastructure socialism. But this is a term that implies very important um, features. It's not that catchy, that, that's the reason why we have used the term solidarity mode of living in our book. And I'm yeah, looking forward to our discussion. Many thanks for your attention. And I'm particularly looking forward to the comments by Dennis and Gustavo. Many thanks. Thank you so much, Marcos, for this very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I will uh, just based on the uh, alphabetic order, give the word to Dennis. Yeah, great. So um, thanks a lot, Marcus, um, uh, for, for this uh, for this great uh, summary of, of, of the main ideas of the book, uh, which of course <laughs> I've known for quite a while since it appeared in German uh, a couple of years ago. And um, what I have to offer is uh, a, a few reflections from the from the German speaking point of view, where of course we've had these debates for a while, and 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 I'll try to give you a few impressions of, um, uh, of what the discussions around this have been in the German speaking uh, countries, and um, and offer a few uh, loosely connected 
uh, ideas about uh, uh, about what I heard in the last uh, uh, 20, 30 minutes. So um, I think what's uh, for the for the praise first. <laughs> Uh, I think what's what, what the really important contribution and strength of the book, um, uh, and and it's not the only book that has uh, that has these strengths, but it's made them in a particularly uh, pointed way, uh, is to shift the focus of debate uh, within degrowth and climate movements away from all of these individualistic attribution and responsabilization debates. While we're all responsible and we need to start with ourselves, blah blah blah. Um, and sort of bringing structure back in uh, to, to thinking, well, it's always been there to, to, to be frank, but um, sort of strengthening the point that we need to talk about societal structure and about structural forces that are beyond subjectivity, um, beyond our subjective influence, um, bringing that back into movement discourses without denying the importance of everyday practice. And that's of course what the, what, what the term imperial mode of living does very well in a nutshell. Um, so, so saying, well, it's important to talk about uh, the, the way people live, um, uh, but we must not be fooled into saying, oh, it's about our ecological footprint. Um, so th that I think is extremely important and it is an important work of connecting the dots of, of uh, discussions that have often been sort of isolated from each other or not, not connected in, 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 in public consciousness or in movement consciousness as highlighting the connections um, and the, the, the interrelatedness uh, between the global or planetary and the personal, between the ecological and the social, um, between uh, social dominance and environmental destruction, between the appropriation of nature and the appropriation and exploitation of labor. Um, and uh, uh, in, in doing this, I think uh, when it appeared five years ago, I would say uh, within the German speaking debate, it marked sort of an important juncture and there were one or two other books making very similar points appearing at the same time that also contributed to this um, uh, it marked a very important juncture in the evolution of degrowth and climate movements and their thinking um, and um, it, it's not a coincidence um, that uh, I think it's not a coincidence that this book and the term that it established uh, uh, was suc so successful and uh, drew so much uh, debate after it, um, uh, because uh, I think it, it, it has two strengths in the background of uh, uh, th th that are sort of connected to, to you, Marcus, and, and Uli as the people that wrote it and the experiences that went into it. One is the experiential background of the alter globalization movement and all the debates connected to it, because of course, uh, the two of you are activists uh, and have been involved uh, in, in a very intense way in, 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 the, in the activism of this movement and, and, and this, this plurality of movements for a long time and also uh, in global context and in different parts of the world. And all of these uh, experiences have entered into what you've written there. Um, so that's the one, this experiential background of all of these debates and movements. And the other thing that is extremely important and that's perhaps not as obvious is the theoretical context of a tradition that has struggled for a very long time um, to get to an integral, integrated understanding uh, of the inherent relationship between modern capitalist expansionism, between social domination uh, and the domination of, of nature um, and the relevance of societal totality for understanding all of this. And I'm talking of course um, uh, about the, the tradition, not just of Marxism, but of the Frankfurt School uh, and, and the whole debate around societal nature relations in that context. I think it's not, not, not always as obvious in, in non-German speaking context um, that, that this is an extremely important background here and uh, the, the influence of people like Christoph Görg, uh, who have done a lot of work in social ecology um, and he's, of course, always worked very closely with Uli Brandt um, and also you, Markus. Um, but uh, I think it's, it, it's worthwhile to stress here that, uh, that it's easy to overlook that, but that it's very important um, to see this, this thinking um, of a societal totality um, that, that sparks both the ex expansionism or that, that, that is behind both the expansionism and the domination of nature and social domination. Um, and that needs to be challenged sort of in, 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 in this form of, of totality. Um, 
um, is very important to understanding what, what the concept of imperial mode of living is really about. Um, uh, and, and, and this theoretical context, of course, enables you to come up with a, a, a concept um, that uh, that can frame these things in such a comprehensive way from uh, a global level, connected with uh, all of your specific movement experiences back there. Um, so I think it was important to say uh, and stress this. Uh, and my third point then would be um, uh, sort of against, uh, so what, what, what is, has this uh, achieved? I think that, that, that has in the, in, in the German speaking, uh, movement landscape, uh, there's very, very recently been a rather impressive spate of intellectual activity in scholar activist circles um, that, that was sparked and inspired by the book. I was, I was uh, in, in the bookstore in Jena just today and I looked at the social science uh, shelf and there were about three books um, by other young, much younger people dealing with the concept of the imperial mode of living or discussing the implications um, so there's a lot of stuff coming out right now, and of course, uh, in, in, within Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, among other places, uh, we're involved in a lot of debates with uh, with a young generation of scholars and activists uh, about this, and it's it's it's, it's gotten young people um, to think in in in, in very many very uh, interesting and new directions. Um, so that, 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 all, all of that is still praise. Um, uh, but up until now, um, uh, my impression, and, and that's where sort of my, my, my somehow critical uh, invective is, is starting, um, my impression is um, that the view uh, of both northern or dominant societies and southern or dominated societies that comes with this is still uh, a, a bit too monolithic. I mean, I'm, I'm a sociologist, uh, and, and you're more, more more like political scientists. Uh, and I think that's that's where the, where, where the difference lies. But um, uh, of course, there's been a lot of debate. Well, aren't there also people uh, involved in the imperial mode of living within the South? Or aren't there people who are dominated in the North? Yeah, sure. But uh, um, my impression is that often the debate has sort of stopped at saying, well, but you can't be that monolithic and you can't just say the North is dominant and the South is dominated. Um, but uh, what what's still uh, lacking to, to some degree is, is, is tools to come to terms with uh, the differences within the societies, and then that, that's of course extremely important for the question of, of the perspectives of struggle against it, right? Um, so um, um, one observation that uh, uh, that I can share from from looking at the introduction and the and and the finishing uh, part for the English uh, version of the book um, uh, is that the reflections on the pandemic situation and the possible sociopolitical consequences in the in the uh, afterward uh, of the English version uh, that were written in 2020 haven't aged particularly well. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to say um, uh, that, 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 that there was a lot of, in, in a way, there was a lot of hope about, well, people have experienced what crisis is and, and they've experienced that the state can actually act and um, uh, that, that uh, state power, if, uh, if it's put onto, onto pressure, can be put to uh, can be put to use, and, and that, that, that's about struggling for the right use of that. Um, and my impression is, well, a lot, a lot of the things that, that, that you were half hopefully saying in that, in that afterward uh, have, have gone a very, very different way. And part of the reason for that is, of course, other unexpected crisis. The war in Ukraine was, was nowhere on the horizon when you wrote that, um, at least not for us Western Europeans. Um, but um, uh, I think it's not just this, there's other crisis coming up and then, th th then it looks a bit different, but it's also um, uh, that, of course, you have a very strong concept of power relations and, and with, with all the Gramscian hegemony theory and Polanzas uh, theory of the state, you have a very strong concept of power relations and, and, and of uh, hegemonic projects on all of these things. But of course, uh, the focus from a political science point of view is then always on sort of mobilized and organized socio-political actors, but not so much sort of on the social base 
on 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 what's happening below the level of what what ha what is happening in in discourse. That is what are people in broader society in, in in the broader population thinking, feeling, and 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 how do they how do they conceive of these things? Uh, that is, in other words, uh, what what are actually the social basis of support for the three different crisis strategies that you've been talking about? My and my own work for uh, uh, for Germany, and I've, I've, I've used uh, uh, survey. Uh, survey data um, to, to come up with a landscape of the different socio-ecological mentalities and these, these camps supporting the different strategies for 2018 has shown um, uh, a landscape that shows that there, there were sort of support bases for precisely these three um, strategies or not not quite precisely but there, there was sort of one third of, of people in Germany where, where you could say this is sort of an eco-social camp that would be broadly in line with the vision of social socio-ecological transformation um, of course very heterogeneous in that but in some way um, uh, th th there was a, a camp of about 20 to 25 percent that would would be on the authoritarian side and opposing it all um, and um, uh, sort of su supporting authoritarian stabilization and moving sort of back to the 1960s kind of uh, society. Um, and the ecological modernization was sort of encapsulated within the, the within the 40% in, in, in the, the, the top center of society in, in Germany that were, that, that were uh, well, well that, that had gained from and that had been the winners of, of what had happened in terms of growth politics in Germany over the 10 years before since the crisis. Um, but since, since 2018, I think a lot has happened. And I'm not so sure that this, this picture of you have, you have this, this uh, neoliberal growth uh, camp, and then you have an eco-social camp, and you have a, um, an authoritarian camp is still intact. And, and we're working on that with our own data just now to find out how, how these things have shifted. But my impression is that especially the, the government that we have now in Germany, the Ampel, uh, the traffic lights government um, is trying to sort of revamp ecological modernization and to put eco ecological modernization more strongly into the, the focus of ruling politics. Um, and that, that, that has two consequences. Uh, one is the, the the marginalization of sort of the more radical flank of the eco-social camp. So uh, the, 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 more, the more moderate parts are integrated and the Greens are telling them, so now we're, we're doing all these things. And of course, while well, we have to make do with the liberals, but you know, we're, we're now doing all the things we promised, but it takes a little longer than we hoped for. And uh, well, you know, we have to deal with these other guys. Um, uh, and, and, and those people that say, no, but we need to keep what we, we still actually need a transformation and not just talk about it, um, are becoming marginalized. Um, and on the other hand, you have a regrouping of the right with the conservative party trying to uh, recalibrate its relation with the fascist right. Um, so it, it's, a very, it's a very dynamic constellation where I find it very hard uh, or well, no, where, where, where I'm, I'm currently thinking uh, it might be that these three stat strategies are no longer intact that way, but that the, the, the newfound dominance of, of the eco, um, ecological modernization strategy um, is, is shifting uh, uh, the meaning, is affecting and changing the meaning of the other strategies as well. And this is a task for degrowth and, and, and climate movements uh, to redefine what it actually is that they're about. And your idea is one, uh, or your book um, uh, is one uh, argument for uh, that it should be, um, uh, 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 what was the word? Democratic, internationalist, ecological, feminist, infrastructure, socialism. Um, and I would say that is uh, th that would be the idea that um, uh, you need alliances of internalization. And, and it would mean sociologically within countries of the global north um, that you would need to, to, to struggle for social alliances uh, of those groups who are within, within the north, within the dominant countries, uh, within the societies of externalization in, in a position where they're forced to internalize parts of, of uh, the burdens of the mode of living of others um, while still in a way participating in um, the imperial mode of living. Um, and you would have to, to, to have a consciousness within these alliances um, that 
that this participation in the mode of living is the kind of privilege that you need to actively forfeit in order to be able to act in solidarity with the people that are really bearing the brunt, um, that is uh, the rest of the world. Um, but that, uh, at this point, um, I'm, I'm finding hard to see represented in, in really in, in um, political movements um, that, that, are, that are getting any traction or any, um, any, any public exposure at this point. Um, the one movement uh, that is very prominent at this point, uh, and that's my last observation, uh, is this, uh, uh, this group called uh, the, last, uh, the Last Generation, Letzte Generation, which is very prominent in German media uh, at this point. Uh, and they, they, they block streets and glue them to the ground, and they block the airports and glue them to the ground. Um, and uh, th there's a lot of anger about them. Um, and I think it's important uh, to, uh, to, to call for solidarity with them. Um, um, but I, I think the, the diagnostically interesting thing is um, that this whole thing about global solidarity and about the interrelatedness between social dominance and, and dominance over nature seems to have been lost along the way. If I look at how, these, uh, how, how this group talks about uh, climate change and politics and, and how they state their mission in, 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 uh, in comparison to, for example, Ende Gelände or Fridays for Future, the, the actors that were dominant just one or two years ago. Um, and, and that's it. Sorry for being a bit long. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Marcus, do you want to uh, answer or reflect upon the, the comments before we give the word to Gustavo? Um, I, I think uh, maybe Gustavo goes on and then I reflect on, on both of you. Yeah, many thanks, Dennis. That was really great. I could have gone on listening to you. and but <laughs> Yes. Can, can I sh share maybe my screen? Because I have some, some slides just with images just to accompany my comments about uh, if, if I can. If it... Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I uh, think it's not, it's to... not allowed. I, I, it's not allowed right now, but, um, but I here, basically here, I, I think, uh, yeah, there is um, Mattia, right, who could maybe allow Gustavo to share screen. Yeah, so uh, I, I yes, will start uh, by by agreeing with with what uh, Dennis was saying about the the usefulness of the imperial mode of living concept um, as a as a concept that that really captures um, uh, a missing dimension. No discussions about. Uh, eco-socialism about eco-imperialism before uh, which is the everyday dimension you no know? and and the way that 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 uh, ecological imperialism and the uh, and the ex extraction and exploitation of nature and of, of labor as a uh, um, uh, as a as a characteristic of capitalism of global capitalism gets inscribed in everyday practices um and and i found it very useful to think about the the work that I, that i've been that i've been doing about puerto rico so i wanted to kind of maybe uh, uh, talk about how i see it it manifested in puerto rico the imperial mode of living and 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 to think about really the the uh, another usefulness of the concept is to give it structure uh, the structural um uh, historical um uh, context of how these modes of production and consumption and the, the overall the social relations of capitalism come into being in particular contexts um, uh, um, uh, through the let's say the the, the the cultural dimension of the hege hegemony, but also through particular regulations, plans, you know, the mode of regulation uh, uh, that that you talk about. Um, so I, I just wanted to then uh, show a little bit of, of the context of Puerto Rico and how it can be useful uh, to understand in a in a let's say in a colonial context, which which let's say is is a global condition, but it's also particular to specific territories and and Latin America and the Caribbean being one of the regions where we really see this this manifestation of of imperial power historically and the, the expansion of the capitalist mode of production through direct imperialist interventions and and colonization of territories you no know? and so so the caribbean actually is is a region that today still is a colonial zone uh, and, and in that sense it's, it's very much where we see the extremes 
of the imperial mode of living in a way i would say and puerto rico i would show i will show with some statistics how it's really an extreme form of the imperial mode of living in some senses no um and uh, 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 we have uh, Puerto Rico being a colony of the United States since 1898, before that a Spanish colony um, uh, since the, the, the uh, late 1400s, so really never independent, become, being an independent territory since more than 500, 600 years ago, almost. Um, uh, the Virgin Islands, we have... Um, we have the, uh, Haiti now as a, as a almost occupied, permanently occupied zone. Um, and, and we have other islands like San Martin, um, uh, Dutch colony and, and others. And, and uh, the, the narrative when the United States came is that we really, they needed to teach us, you know, then this is a part of this, how in the imperial mode of living gets, gets, gets taught, really gets, it is 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 uh, how this hegemony gets constructed is through this idea that the colonial subject needs to be taught that it's ignorant, no, that we are we we are underdeveloped, we are poor, we are ignorant, and we need to be taught how to live properly, you know. So this is I I find very uh, good connection between narratives and studies of of uh, colonization and the colonial logics of power. And, and the colonial logics of knowledge in particular, no, um, but also of production and consumption and how those uh, get related to uh, then uh, high levels of consumption eventually and, 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 and other forms of the imperial mode of living. But, uh, you know, it's also interesting to see that, that activists uh, have, have noted how this is also a way of, of getting used to dying slowly, you know, and in a way. So, so this just a position of this, high levels of progress of consumption of of this supposed idea of well-being uh, that that was brought by colonization while at the same time it's also a kind of a, a slow violence a toxic a toxic uh, way of life that that kills us slowly and and, and sometimes rapidly and so this the the I think uh, Mark, Marcus and Ulrich's analysis of the of the fordist period you no know, as as a, as a turning point as a really important this, it, it is is very relevant in Puerto Rico, but but of course it just it didn't just happen. No, it was really a planned experiment, or, as part of the colonization of Puerto Rico to really Americanize us, to um, keep political loyalties, so that the governing party could say that they were doing development, that they were generating jobs, in a context of of high levels of rural poverty and pauperization you know, in the 1930s and 40s. So there is this new deal that comes into Puerto Rico. It comes with a particular slant of cementing the US imperial power in Puerto Rico. You know, through and, and how that happened, it was by shifting or agriculture, really pushing peasants away from, from the land, taking them away through land grabbing, uh, taking land and, and Marcus points to and, and Ulrich point to, to green grabbing and land grabbing as a, as a future direction, but it's also a, an important historical context in at least in many countries of how peasants were pushed away from the land and were made into a wage labor dependent so that they could be good consumers and, and, and good political subjects also, and they could support the party that gave them the job and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, no? This was a highly toxic uh, project in Puerto Rico and in many other places because it, it involved petrochemical industries, pharmaceuticals, and it came with all kinds of government, of, of, a, of an infrastructure of regulation, of a mode of regulation that was basically a, a permanent state of colonial exception, as has been called by, by legal scholar Jose Atiles, which basically said, you know, you can come here, you don't need to meet the environmental standards of the U.S., you can come and, and you can produce with higher methane levels, uh, higher sulfur levels, the, the, the petrochemical, the, the oil refineries, or the pharmaceuticals, you can throw in some more toxics uh, be above the levels that the water uh, regulations in the US uh, allow, uh, et cetera, et cetera. No? And of course, um, uh, other, other forms of subsidies and all, uh, a whole infrastructure to support this, this process of industrialization uh, that was called Operation Bootstrap, so also a military logic attached to it, which was not just a symbolic uh, thing, but also land grabbing happened in the form of taking land for military bases, because, because the imperial mode of living came not only with the industrialization and with the Fordist mode of, of production and consumption, but it also came with the cement, uh, cementing 
the United States position, military position in the Caribbean and Latin American context with the expansion of military bases and, and, and using Puerto Rico as a point of departure then also for invasions and, and other tactics of, of cementing the imperial mode of living in the whole region. You know? I think that was also important. And the case of Vieques became famous eventually after 60 years of military bombings and people protesting too, because people in Vieques were literally paid $5 for, per acre to, to get them out of the land if they were paid at all. Um, the, these were mostly subsistence peasants, which nowadays is discussed as a, you know, as a more, more sustainable way of life that was basically destroyed through, through this process. No? Uh, uh, this is this is an example of how I, uh, why I say it's an extreme imperial mode of living. If we compare actually Puerto Rico to other Latin American countries, Puerto Rico has the highest per per capita amount of of McDonald's and Burger Kings in all of Latin America. So even even in in absolute numbers, it, it's stark. If you think that Puerto Rico has, has a population now of about 3 million, but this data is from 2013 when Puerto Rico had like 3.8 million. Um, and it had 105 um, um, uh, Burger Kings and 180, uh, 105 McDonald's and 183 um, uh, Burger Kings. And, and for the, the amount of, but Brazil has 212 million people and Mexico has, you know, 126 million people. <laughs> So if you do it in per capita, it's like uh, Puerto Rico has like, um, I made the calculations, it's, it's like um, 10, about 10 times, eight times more per capita <laughs> than these countries, no? Um, and Mexico is right there next to the US. And of course, with, with um, and this is also another example with these large chain stores that, that uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, the Walmarts and the Walgreens and how they've also, Puerto Rico per square mile has the highest number of Walmarts and Walgreens in all of the US. So even the use of a colony to really make it even more American than the US itself. So we often joke about this, that, that we, we are made because we are colonial subjects that are made to think that we are inferior, we have to be more American. In, in our values and in our way of life and in our consumption levels. Um, the, the, the petrochemical system, uh, going back to that a little bit, one of the, the things that it, that it generated was like an extremely high level of energy consumption because the, it, it, it built all these, all these energy infrastructure that was not really for, for uh, residential consumption for people, basic daily life uh, needs, but was for the petrochemical industries and for the pharmaceutical industry. So they built these huge things that didn't really match the amount of consumption of, of people or the needs or the uh, what, what Marcos was saying, the sufficiency of needs of, of people. And then what they did was they, they kept those, those big infrastructures even after the factories closed. So they started to promote that basically people should consume more energy because we had all this infrastructure producing all this energy. And, and so to keep up with the, with the cost of those, of, of operating those. But in the 1970s, just to give you an idea, the, the Corco oil refinery complex it consumed more energy than um, uh, I think it was 15 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. So just to give an idea of the, the, the extreme level of, of energy consumption. I, I, I want to share one, one thought that I had uh, while reflecting on this. And, and, uh, on the work of the IML is what is the connection to uh, to the debt as a form of governance uh, at the debt as a product of the imperial mode of living no but also as a form of governance that that comes together and becomes part of a new the more of the regulation of the imperial mode of living if you will uh, and so Puerto Rico is also in in an extreme in the sense of uh, of its debt crisis and uh, currently is in a process of, of bankruptcy they call it the the Greek the Greece of the Caribbean. We have like 74 billion US dollars. So, so that's 74,000 um, millions of US dollars in debt, um, public debt. Then if we talk about the private debt, it's another way that we're, where this relationship maybe becomes even more visible, no? Um, uh, some ecological economists uh, and degrowth uh, scholars like George Scalis have argued that the current mode of, of growth is really, is really uh, sustained by debt. And, and if we think of, of personal debt also of how the imperial mode of living really requires 
people to to adapt themselves because there's no way to live with these standards especially in a context of puerto rico and and i think in many contexts now with the rising cost puerto rico has one of the highest uh, cost of basic foods in, in in the world in terms of the basic basket of food because 85 percent of our food is imported another result of the industrialization process which was the destruction of the agricultural production uh, uh, and and so all of our food comes from the united states and uh, apart from being junk food, as we saw with Burger King and McDonald's, it's, all, it's also very costly. So it uh, it leads to the uh, we are also have one, the lowest salary of all U.S. states and territories, uh, about half of the poorest uh, state of of the United States, which I think is is misery. Um, and so so we have to indebt ourselves publicly and privately, you know. Um, and, and then this becomes a, a new form of governance. So they imposed the fiscal control board in Puerto Rico in 2016 to, to pay off that debt. Uh, and this basically comes with the idea of austerity as inevitable. Now, does austerity imply that we are going back on the imperial mode of living in the sense of high levels of excess levels of, of overall consumption and uh, or maybe it's just a, a manifest a becoming of a more extreme form of inequality now, where just a few rich people will be able to live in Puerto Rico or in countries and regions like that. And, and then the vast majority will have to migrate elsewhere, which is already happening uh, in, in Puerto Rico. We've lost uh, uh, more than 600,000 people in the last 10 years uh, alone from migration and, uh, and death. We also had many deaths after Hurricane Maria. Um, and just to finalize with the, I, I like that that Marcus and Ulrich used this word of, of the solidarity mode, no? Because uh, really, solidarity has been the 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 discourse uh, of, of the of some of the strongest movements that have emerged in Puerto Rico in the last years um, uh, against austerity politics and against what is called they have called the colonial disaster that particularly manifested itself after Hurricane Maria in 2017, when uh, the whole country was with ele without electricity for month and month, um, uh, more than 4,000 people died because of this um, lack of medical services, lack of food, um, lack of water. Um, and so you see the extremes and the, the way that, it, and also the differences within a country, you know, because some of the na richest neighborhoods of the island had electricity, people who could afford like big power generators, people who had political connections, they could get their electricity restored sooner while the poorer regions, the poor neighborhoods took longer. We actually did a study on this and, and showed how uh, it was uh, measured in weeks, longer waits for people who were in black, more black neighborhoods, people who did not have the political connections and people who were in lower income areas waited longer for electricity. Um, of course, many of these in the mountain regions. And so what happened is that people self-organized to provide themselves with food, to provide with them with water, with basic needs. In some cases, community organizations that had developed their own uh, basic solar systems to provide for sufficiency, you know, for, for basic needs, uh, for refrigerating medicine, for, um, uh, for communication purposes, for for having water uh, 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 purification, they were able to to organize this these mutual aids to cook, um, and and they did collective kitchens, um, and and the idea that the slogan was here we serve solidarity, not not, not we, we cannot eat austerity and we serve solidarity, so I I, I find these uh, these ideas kind of connected directly, um, uh, some of these projects. Uh, have developed then their own uh, solar systems that I was a uh, community solar project, their own food, uh, local uh, food production, small scale food production. This is in, in Adjuntas, uh, one, one initiative that has been one of the most famous ones, let's say, because they are really trying to turn the whole town into a, a solar system. Now we could also discuss the contradictions of that in terms of where do those solar panels come from, where you know, taking the, the, the global perspective that Marcus and Ulrich also invite us in terms of the inequalities, you know, uh, what countries can have access to these kind of things and, and where is it produced and what uh, where is the minerals extracted from? I think it's also relevant. 
Um, but in terms of sufficiency, these are really solar systems geared to, to basic needs, not, not to large uh, corporate uh, or, or rich level of consumption. Uh, and finally, the, I think the, the agroecology movement has been one of the, the strongest the proponents of, of, of really shifting our, our system, our, our, our whole system towards this kind of good life, uh, solidarity, but also self-sufficiency and, and, and in terms of the food production, but also in terms of the relations of labor. In terms of they, they did a lot of, of solidarity brigades in the last years, supporting each other in the farming, in the farmers movement. Uh, well, they built houses that, that were destroyed. They installed a, a small solar system that, that could serve for basic needs in these, in these farms. They've really been been connecting also with discussion about climate justice and what it means to have a just recovery in in the context of increasing climate crisis and debt crisis and, and that's all. Um, so thank you, thank you, Marcos, uh, for for the the inspiration to to have this discussion and um, um, I look forward to to more discussions and also Dennis, thank you for your comments before that also uh, helped uh, instigate. Thank you, Gustavo, for adding um, this important perspective on the topic. Um, Marcus, uh, I give the word to you. Yeah, many thanks to Gustavo and Dennis for this excellent comments. And it was much more than comments. It was a very interesting presentation by Gustavo. And let me react on both of you. So Gustavo, this, that I learned a lot from your presentation and it was uh, really great to see um, how a certain mode of living um, yeah, has concrete impacts on a particular country or colony. Or, um, I had to think about uh, a term that has been developed by two other colleagues from Jena, Anna Landherr and, and Jakob Graf. They have worked on Chile and they talk about uh, so-called peripheral imperial mode of living. That is an imperial mode of living that is strongly shaped and supported by a certain class structure and by an export-oriented economy. And whose role also consists in internalizing and thus processing the contradictions that are produced by the um, inclusion of this country into the world market, that is by the externalization processes of the global north. Yeah. And that was quite interesting. It came into my mind when I listened to your presentation. Yeah, and I would have uh, two questions um, um, following your presentation. Then. I, uh, you, you talked about this fossilist infrastructures and industries that were created in times of Fordism. And to which extent are they still working? What, what has happened to them? Are they still an important part of the economy in, in Puerto Rico? Or have they got into a crisis, perhaps a crisis that is related to the debt crisis you have mentioned? The second question would be, how would you assess the strengths of the progressive movement in Puerto Rico that you mentioned um, at the end of the presentation? I think this is quite interesting to see uh, this movement. Yeah, it seems to be a quite, it seems to be a movement that seems to be a movement that have an impact yeah, because they are really um, based in crucial social issues, in agricultural um, issues, in urban issues, and and so on. Yeah. And um, how do they how is the strength to be assessed of these movements and yeah to which extent might they also benefit from a certain crisis of the fossilist infrastructures that have been created in the decades after the second world war that would be two questions yeah. regarding the comment by dennis again also many thanks for this yeah let me um, take up three points yeah. you talked about this uh, monolithic view of northern and southern societies you're right, yeah, that was an important critique that we got after the publication of our book. And um, some people went so far that they said we are constructing a new um, main contradiction that, um, that supersedes every other social contradiction, the contradiction between the global north and the global south, and we neglect the class contradiction, gender issues, 
race relations and so on in the countries themselves. Yeah. We have worked a lot on that since the publication of our book and we have focused, for example, on, on class issues and tried to elaborate on to, on the extent to which the imperial mode of living also is a class issue. That is, to which extent the very capitalist character of the northern societies has produced this social ecological effects that are transferred to the global south. Yeah. The fact that um, um, workers, um, subaltern classes in the global north cannot do but to uh, produce social ecological cause because of their subaltern position in capitalist societies. Yeah. So we try to emphasize the structural category of the uh, the structural character of the category imperial mode of living. It's not an issue of choice. It's not something with which we would like to blame the, the northern working class. It's, it's not something with which we would negate class conflict. Yeah. It is the very class conflict. It's the processing of the class conflict that has contributed to the imperial mode of living. So the imperial mode of living and the fact that a lot of social ecological costs have been produced is also due to a development um, that has to do a lot with class conflict. The fight of the working class to participate in the wealth that has been created by the capitalist societies. Yeah. And this fight has resulted in the class compromise and this class compromise is a major driving factor also of the imperial mode of living that would be our argument so we cannot understand the imperial mode of living without taking into account how the class conflict has been developing in the context of the global north and how it has been processed and how a class compromise has also been created on the basis of more extraction of natural resources it would be one point. Yeah, I would perhaps yeah agree with you regarding the Corona pandemic. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we were a bit more um, optimistic uh, two years ago and, and thought that this pandemic, um, yeah, um, besides all the suffering it has produced also has shown us what is really systemically relevant yeah it was the idea yeah? in the crisis of 2008 2009 everybody talked about the systemic relevance of banks they were too big to fail but nobody talked about the relevance of uh, social infrastructures and care work that is of a social uh, sphere that proved to be extremely and much more systemically relevant than banks in the corona pandemic. It did not result in better working conditions or hardly resulted in better working conditions. But nevertheless, I would say it's a lasting experience. And people have experienced something that uh, or something had, has become visible that perhaps has not been so visible before. Yeah? And we do not know about the long-term effects. Maybe, maybe it is a lasting experience that will have a certain an effect on the collective legacy, the collective memory in Northern societies. Um, maybe one, um, one last point so that um, I do not take too much time with my response. You talked about the last generation and its activities. I'm, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't um, agree with you when you say that the link between the social and ecological issues is lost yeah, um, in the activities of this generation. I would say that this link never has been so strong. Yeah. It was um, a link, of course, it was quite strong in Ende Gelände, but I think the most influential social, social movement in the last years was Fridays for Future. The fact that that what you described in your um, in, in your presentation, the fact that the ecological modernization approach has become more dominant, I think it's more or less a result of the protests of the um, of Fridays for Future. Yeah? And the Gelände um, is older, yeah, and it didn't have this effect. Of course, it was important also. I wouldn't neglect that. That is a very important experience, a very important movement. Yeah? But Fridays for Future was more important in influencing the dominant policy. That would be my, my, my argument. And they were never, um, they were never um, eager to combine social and ecological effects very strongly. That was only a minor part of Fridays for Future. Yeah. 
I wouldn't blame them for not doing that because it was a very important politicizing experience. Yeah. But what, and they, what, what they did, and I think that is the decisive difference between Fires for Future and the last generation. What they did is that they mainly focused on yeah, addressing politics, state politics. State politics, you have to act, you have to change something, you have to um, you have to 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 um, think about better and more effective environmental measures against climate change. Yeah. So it was a certain state centrism, not centrism, a certain, a certain state centered and um, form of doing the policy. Yeah, a bit naive understanding of the state. The state is the actor that has to enact the reforms. Yeah, not understanding that the state, of course, is not a new train, but it is a manifestation of social power relations that cannot simply act against the climate crisis. It is part of the problem and not only part of the solution. Yeah. And I think the actions of the last generation are a consequence of this understanding of, of political, of politics. Yeah. They have understood, the last generation has, has understood that um, appealing to the state, taking the state and uh, making the state responsible, yeah, hoping that the state is going to act, that that doesn't work. And now they have gone to the opposite. They have taken a confrontive position against the state. They tried to counteract the state. They tried to counteract the social for, for the, the dominant social forces via civil disobedience. Yeah. And I would say, and both importance are, both, both movements are important. But what we have to do is to better understand the capitalist state, to better understand the contradictions within the capitalist state to identify, and that is what Uli and I are currently doing um, within a new book, to identify so-called course of opposition and transformation within the state that, of course, depend on resonances with progressive social movements, it have to, but that have to be taken into account. So it would be a position in between, not simply confronting the state as a monolithic block, as perhaps the last generation does, and also not taking seeing the state as a kind of alliance a partner that can be made responsible and but understanding the state in its contradictions and thereby identifying points um, entry points where um, of, for progressive politics that of course need a certain basis in movements too thank you very Uh, thank you, uh, all three of you, and um, we are very much approaching the end of the seminar while um, uh, we might squeeze in one question or two if there are any um, one from the audience that would like to engage in the discussion. Sarah, do you want to? Yes, thank you, Monica, and thank you for this super interesting discussion and also presentation and the topic. Uh, I have a very uh, general question because I'm also working on sufficiency uh, concept on my research and also logic of care when it comes to developing a kind of ethical consumption. But I was wondering that Marcus, uh, because when I read your paper, I noticed that uh, you uh, develop an idea that we need to uh, take distance a little bit from uh, governmental policies because uh, it is not the only solution that we have and we need to, and as you presented here that we need to, for example, democratize the market and also um, uh, yeah, we need to, um, apply new strategies. But I was wondering, okay, if uh, if a government uh, doesn't have a sufficient rule uh, to implement new strategies, but how, how we can, how we can, for example, democratize the market, how we can implement, for example, sufficiency in our everyday practices, I mean, uh, what, what is your thought about this? What is your suggestion? And uh, what do you see the idea that 
what is the solution here? Who has more power than government to make new rules, new regulations or policies? Uh, for example, when it comes to production culture. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many thanks. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I, I would agree with you that the government has power resources yeah, and it can set rules. It can do so within a certain room of manure. It can not transcend certain restrictions that are pre-given, I would say, by the very form of the capitalist state. Yeah. Then his, in his presentation mentioned Polanzian state theory. That is a tradition which Uli and, and myself are strongly rooted. So we understand the state neither as a neutral actor nor as a simply reflection of capitalist power but we understand it of as a um, as a terrain of conflict and but a terrain of conflict that is not neutral it's a terrain of conflict where there where certain structural selectivities have to be taken into account structural selectivities that prevent certain interests from generalizing themselves via the terrain of the state yeah. there are certain actors who, because of their social power, have a much more privileged access to the state than, for example, actors that um, suggest to fight for more sufficiency and to also institutionalize sufficiency in certain rules. That would be my argument here. Yeah. So it's difficult. It's difficult to do that while addressing the state. Yeah. Of course, we should address the state and try to, to enhance the space the state has for progressive regulations. Yeah. But I think this depends largely on the shift in social power relations and the social relations of forces, it has to come from below. That is a historical experience. The fact that the state can act and can change things to the better, although only with a limited scope, is also is always has always been a result of progressive social movements. The European Green Deal, I would not um, um, overestimate that. Yeah, it's an ecological modernization program, but the fact that it exists can only be understood, that would be my um, my argument, it can only be understood against the background of a rising climate movement in recent years of Fridays for Future. Yeah. Without them, we wouldn't have the, green, the European Green Deal. Yeah. So that would be my starting point, to think from the perspective of social movements and to think from the perspective of, yeah, perhaps what Dennis has called alliances of internalization, yeah. progressive alliances of um, social movements, including the trade unions, yeah, including the progressive part of trade unions, that is quite hard yeah, because trade unions may also be very hesitant or even reluctant towards social ecological transformation. But if it is possible to include them in such a transformational strategy, then we will also enhance the space for state action in this regard. And perhaps and social movements and reforms always can create their own dynamic, perhaps a dynamic that even goes beyond certain capitalist forms of socialization and the restrictions of the capitalist state. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Francesca, are you raising your hand? Y yes. Um, y um, I, um, I, Marcus asked something to Gustavo that I was looking forward to listen <laughs> and reply. I mean, how, uh, how much impact the social movement organization, the solidarity of the movement organization have uh, in what you have described, in the context you have described? Because if I think about what has happened in the last uh, few years in Italy, I mean, this kind of organization where, I mean, gaining quite a lot of attention and also they were able to mobilize some, some people, mainly middle classes, basically, at least, uh, uh, I guess, in Europe, not just in Italy. And so I, I was wondering, what, what, what are your thoughts about that? Because Marcus has asked this question. <laughs> and. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, a very interesting discussion, I think, um, about uh, also the, the importance of alliances. Uh, maybe I can connect that to, to this issue of alliances and how the influence of the on the state and the, the, let's say the, the state as a, as a relation also as a balance of forces, that uh, terrain of struggle 
but also with, with some conditions that, as Marcos has explained, and uh, I think that in, in Puerto Rico, um, uh, particularly, what uh, what I can say is that uh, these movements had a particularly um, a strong effect on the development of local solidarity initiatives that uh, or the strengthening of local solidarity initiatives that have remained until this day. Um, in some cases, these were already existing for decades, and the, these kind of contextual development of uh, mutual aid kitchens during a crisis moment really um, uh, fostered um, uh, the the strengthening of these projects. No? It gave them new impulse, as 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 some of them say, uh, you know, in conversations, in presentations, they they say this, that this was like a new impulse to say develop a community solar project, a food sovereignty initiative at the local level, because it really materialized the contradictions of this. Um, uh, what was the the, the austerity crisis, um, uh, the climate crisis, and and these supposedly high levels of of development that we had in Puerto Rico with these kind of artificial high levels of consumption and that all of a sudden uh, wither away in one moment with a hurricane. No, uh, you know, uh, you, we had a modern electricity system that all of a sudden proved to be a, a failure because it was not built to be resilient to these conditions. It was built mostly for petrochemical factories and not for households. It was, uh, uh, and then uh, you had. Um, a food system that was totally dependent on the imports. And of course, you had a government that was not geared to the needs of the people. It was more geared to the interests of, of particular uh, groups no? and classes. No? And so so this, I think, was one of the legacies of these movements, of these initiatives. Uh, but we have to recognize also that the pandemic really hit hard also on, on these processes of, of struggle that these movements had, had kind of... Uh, and uh, not just in Puerto Rico. I think this was a global condition. The pandemic really, really uh, took it. And then in Puerto Rico also, we had a, an earthquake in 2020. We had another um, a storm uh, recently. So so this kind of accumulating crisis really, I think, and, and on top of that, you still have the fiscal control board, the, this imposition of this governing board that now takes over our finances and imposes austerity by 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 virtue of a bankruptcy court case and so the struggle against that really takes and the, then you have the privatization of the electricity system as one of the measures so you have all these kind of uh, fights that really i think uh, the challenge is really how to center the struggle in a, in this transform in this unitary transform struggle for transformation um uh, and um I would I would say that right now it, the movements do not look as as strong as as we expected them. We, we hoped that they could be in that moment after the hurricane in 2017 and um, and and in the years before where there was a really really strong and some reflections recently from from colleagues and and people in the movements point point to that to, to the dissolution moment right now that. We feel that we've lost so much and the struggles have lost the track. And I think also with Fridays for the Future, with Marcus was mentioning, I think we are in a particular moment of kind of the movements have lost kind of impulse. Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think the pandemic really was a major force, but I don't know if, if now, I mean, if it's still that lagging effect or, or what is it, but uh, I feel like we are in a moment of... Uh, of uh, low energy and maybe it's also the holy the, the holidays and the, the december but <laughs> i don't know if that, that's the generalized feeling here but um uh, i mean we, uh, we have to uh, keep on fighting and um, uh, find ways to build these, these alliances which right now i'm working in a project on alliances between the debt movement or the anti-debt movement let's say anti-austerity movement and the climate justice movement so this is in Puerto Rico, particularly, I think this is a, a promising kind of alliances, really, for instance, showing how, how the, you know, the privatization of electricity will really affect the ability to do a, uh, an energy transition that is for the people and that is sustainable, um, how, how the austerity has really dismantled the whole environmental governance and, and protection system and how we really need to join both struggles in a way. So 
I think this is, and, and there is a series of meetings planned. There is a report that we are preparing that will sustain, generate information about this. So this kind of strategic alliances, I think, are really the, the way forward of how to push for uh, from below, but also trying to influence the state at the same time. I hope you're feeling better, Francesca. Get well soon. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> leading another uh, um, a conflict among the kids here in the kitchen now at, at the moment. But maybe, um, Sarah, could you take over the, the final part? Yes, of course. Uh, I think, yeah, if uh, there is no any other comments or suggestions, uh, we can uh, wrap up the discussion. Uh, if anyone wants to add something, maybe yes. Alicia. Yeah. I don't, sorry, if I have just a few, like my my uh, question is very short, but I don't know whether we have time for an answer. So anyway, I will uh, put that here. Um, I was just wondering what, as we have talked about movements uh, in the context of this uh, critique to the imperial mode of living, I was just wondering what kind of alliances uh, between the South and the, the global South and the global North can we uh, imagine, but also, um uh, something that i um that i'm wondering is uh, is the way in which uh, imperialist or colonial uh, let's say imperial or, or colonial relations are uh, present also in the so called center so for example in the global north in countries of the global north so um also in this kind of um, in this kind of context how do you build the, the um, uh solidarity uh, between subjects who are um let's say uh, on the on the imperial part and and the ones who are the more kind of extracted on and the exploited side thank you mm, marcus would you like to um could you please repeat the second question i didn't totally get it the um Yes, I mean, the, the first part was a bit of a premise, uh, uh, meaning that, mm, to my understanding, the existence of colonial or imperial relations uh, is also applicable to the countries that we normally identify as the centers, let's say, of the global system. So the countries of the global north, for example. So like if I think about Italy, we have a clearly colonial relationship between the north and the south or within certain territories. So I was wondering whether also my uh, question the first part of the question could be um, extended to uh, the second part. So thinking about relationship between imperial, uh, what, what can be uh, recognized as imperial subjects and the ones uh, uh, that, for example, lived in uh, territories of extraction and um, that are more exploited, uh, etc. So that is more or less my point. Yeah, and um, so then I um, I wouldn't um, if I understood you correctly I wouldn't re and use the term colonial for for this relationship but I would talk about uh, these regional differences within the countries of the global north. Yeah. So um, what comes into my mind is what we experience in Germany and currently as a divide between rich parts and poor parts parts that rely, for example, still on lignite mining, they're going to face the lignite phase out in the next years. Yeah. So um, there is um, a specific situation in Eastern Germany in those mining regions that have already experienced a structural change in the course of the German reunification at the beginning of the 1990s, and um, which now are going to experience another structural change that is um, um, that 
Oh, this is a hardship for many people. And, and it is not, I wouldn't talk about a colonial relationship here, and, but it is a, a relationship of asymmetry between individual regions in Germany and the structural heterogeneity within a country. Yeah. I don't know how to politicize these questions in a way that they um, can be articulated progressively. Um, because there is also a strong right-wing force in trying to prevent the regions from being restructured. I think um, as a progressive perspective, there could be um, the fight for democracy and infrastructures. A colleague of mine, Tobias Haas, did, did a research in the Lausitz, Lusatia, that is a region, a mining region in the east of Germany. And what he found out is that um, the um, mining company had provided a lot of social and physical infrastructure in recent years. And that is why the people are very afraid of a retreat of this company, because they are afraid of simply using uh, losing basic infrastructures. Yeah. That leads me to the point I mentioned at the end of my presentation, the infrastructural orientation and also democracy, the participation of people in the structural transition process of this region would be a pre crucial precondition to um, direct this process in a progressive, in a progressive way. Um, yeah, perhaps so far to this point, if the first question referred to alliances and and, and I think what came into my mind, or what could be an interesting entry point here, is that one starts to think about alliances that alliances that cross borders. Yeah, I think there are experiences, and, and people like Nora Rätsel have worked on that, bringing people from different parts of a, of the same value change in contact. Yeah, that is um, contacting people, for example. Um, that work in the German automotive industry or the European automotive industry with people that extract the iron ore in Brazil or elsewhere, yeah? learning from each other, getting to know the working conditions, the social ecological conditions, the living conditions, yeah? and thereby um, creating a sensitivity for the needs of people in other parts of the world to which I am closely related through a value chain, but this relation is not visible, making it visible, and thereby creating consciousness for the needs of other people. I think that would be a good point to create cross-border alliances, besides the alliances that have to be created within the borders of the same country. We have one more comment, please, Dennis. Yeah, it's more of an answer to Alicia's question, I think. Um, <laughs> hi, by the way, <laughs> great to see you. Um, uh, uh, well, I've, I've, I've been, uh, I, I didn't mention it now, but I've been thinking uh, a lot and also writing a bit about, about what I would call the internal peripheries of, of societies of the global north. If I look at a society like Germany, um, of course, it's a, it's a globally dominant uh, society, um, but there are dominated sectors within that society. And, uh, and, and I don't think it's the most helpful way to go about it to look at regions. Um, uh, th that's one way, but, but uh, in, in those regions, what you have is the experience of, of having been devalued and, and of, of social dissent and of destruction, deindustrialization. It's, it's a very, you know, you're in a situation where you've just been losing all the time and then to tell people, well, uh, 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 act in solidarity, uh, uh, identify with the oppressed in the global south doesn't, doesn't really work very well. And that's the political experience we're making. Um, but um, in internal peripheries in a more, uh, in a more more metaphorical sense um, would of course mean um, those people inside these societies who are internalizing burdens uh, of, of others' life, the, the people doing care work, um, the people uh, carrying around people's uh, packages because nobody goes to a store but everybody orders stuff on, uh, on the internet, um, the people uh, doing all the menial chores that other people are, are too lazy and too rich to do and are just passing on to, uh, for, for instance, Romanian, uh, uh, Romanian agricultural helpers who are coming here for three months, earning money for the rest of the year and going back home. Um, uh, all, all of that are, are what I would call internal peripheries. It's, it's here, it's happening here, people live here, um, but they're on the periphery of, of, uh, uh, of, of the regime, of the economic regime um, and the societal regime. 
so that economically and 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 and, and socially pushed to the margins. Um, and and that experience, I think, should be a point of politicization. You know, that's why I said alliances of internalization, um, trying to to make the experience of internalizing the burdens of others' life and 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 the practice of, of you know li living in a situation where most of what you do uh, during a waking life is is to internalize the burdens uh, of what others uh, are experiencing and, and the burdens of others' luxury. Um, uh, that should be the, the point to rally around, and that that should be um, you know see we, we're internalizing, we're suffering from this, we're taking the burdens of uh, of, of, of of others' life, and and so are people in, in in the global south, and so are coming generations who are aren't even here to vote in any election, um, uh, and 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 that's that that I think should be should should be sort of the the the, the wellspring of solidarity that. That there should be, you know, if if you just take 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 the book as a theoretical treatise on on how the world is structured, uh, I would say that that that's what it should should come down to, um, and and then if I look at the kind of work that I'm doing, trying to figure out what what mentalities are there in within the population, and and how do people in different social situations look at the world and and so, sociological questions, um, then then I find okay, there is no mentality of of internalization. There's no sort of type of people um, who, 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 who look at the world with this kind of vision. I know I, I can identify, okay, these are people doing care work. These are people working in the hospitals and in, 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 in care for elderly people and in, in all of these jobs. These are people uh, doing the menial, menial uh, jobs, uh, doing away with the trash. Um, and I, I cannot see a, a sort of a class consciousness of these people. And I think if there would be a left project, it would be a project of class formation, um, of, of, of working and struggling to, 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 to develop a common class consciousness of this, these sectors within the dominant societies as a basis uh, for, for, for a solidarity uh, that would, would then not just be a solidarity uh, in, in, in collectively defending one's own interest, um, but, but struggling for something that, that goes much beyond that and that, that opens up into a universalist horizon and is actually in, in, in solidarity with uh, the rest of the world. discussion is very interesting but i think we need to, uh, we have other obligations and we need to end the discussion now so uh, if there is no any comment questions or something suggestions then uh, thank you so much marcus uh, gustavo and dennis and the others uh,